All right, Deuteronomy chapter 4. Um, Deuteronomy, uh, this chapter is the last chapter in the first section or the first speech that Moses gives here. Uh, just to refresh our memories, what did we say Deuteronomy is about? There's one thing that's commonly talked about, but in reality it's something else, sort of the overall... Okay, usually it's, it's like a second giving of the law, but it really is Moses going through and preaching the law and admonishing the people to keep the law and making some applications as he goes through it. So, as we wrap up that first section, uh, we're going to see a lot of that in here. And in a commentary by Kyle and Dalish, they're German guys, they said the divine manifestations of grace laid Israel under the obligation to a conscientious observance of the law. So they're simply saying when you read chapter 4 here, because of God's goodness and blessings on the people there, that meant they're obligated to do His will, to serve Him, to honor Him. And it really is no different today because of what God's done for us, that puts an obligation on us to be obedient to Him, to honor Him in our lives. Uh, so let's read Deuteronomy 4 verses 1 through 8 to begin with. 1 through 8. Who will grab that for us? Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to observe that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord your God of your fathers is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor, for the Lord your God has destroyed from among you all the men who followed Baal of Peor. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are alive today, every one of you. Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the people who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? For whatever reason we may call upon him. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day? Okay. In this section, really what he's going over is the idea that God's Word is sufficient and it is superior to all other laws and what other people may have. Um, in verse 1, when, he's, when he calls them to attention, you know, now listen to the statutes and the judgments that I teach and observe you. Why, what reason does he give on that? He makes a very specific that reason. That you may live. That you may live. That you may live because there is life in that commandment. You may live, you may be in that land. Uh, and so, teaching of God's statutes are needed and they need to observe is really what is needed here. Not just to have them, to know about them, but to live by them really on a daily basis. Um, now, first two. We've got question one with this. In verse two, you shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it. Well, question one is, I ask you to find similar statements in the Bible to Deuteronomy 4, 2. Revelation 22, 18, Okay, Revelation 22, 18, 19. And what does that say, Charles? Uh, it's at the end of the book. Go ahead. 
Well, I testify to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plague that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the word of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Okay. So that general principle. Now, Revelation 22, 18, 19 applies specifically to the book of Revelation. But it's just showing that that principle is still there relative to God's revelation to man, God's message to man. Don't add to, don't take from. Any other passages? Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in Him. Do not add to His words, lest He rebuke you, and you be found a liar. Okay. So we've got Deuteronomy 4. We have Revelation 22. We have Proverbs 30. So you have beginning, middle, and end where this is repeated essentially the same command don't add to don't take from god's word um any others we want to touch on before we dig just a little bit deeper here 32. deuteronomy 12 32 what you got whatever i command you to be careful to observe it you shall not add to it okay okay very good hey joshua joshua this uh you know what Moses called Joshua 1 7. So he basically saying the same thing. Now let's say here. Only be strong and courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded. Yeah, and in Joshua chapter 1, the Lord specifically tells Joshua, don't go to the right hand or to the left hand, which could be viewed, don't add to, don't take from. Don't, don't go either direction off of that. Zach. Jeremiah chapter 26, verse 2. Thus says the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak to all the cities of Judah who have come to worship the Lord's house. All the words that I have commanded you to speak to them, do not omit a word. <laughs> okay. Can you be any plainer? Do not omit a word. Right? It just shows us that time and again through the Word of God he tells us very specifically don't add to don't take from now our question two was give examples of when men violated this principle this command that's given what are examples of where people just said numbers 24 now that's before this, but what did they do? Twenty-four thousand. Anybody have other examples? It happened at the very beginning when God okay. created man and well created everything. He told them not to eat from the tree or they would die. When Eve responds to the serpent, she added, or touch it. So God never said that. So it's not applied to that, but it's added to this word, technically. And Satan said, um, surely God. And so are those, those might be minor to some, but they're still added to God's word. God's word is made to be completed or clarified. God said, don't eat from the tree or you will die. And Satan and Eve both slightly added to or twisted that. And in Satan's case, it was out of deception. In Eve's case, it was some other issue, some other reason. But those, it happens when they're very. Lust the eye, lust the flesh, pride of life. Yeah, yeah it got her. Philip. Then we get to the New Testament, the birth of Christ, the Pharisees had pretty much warped the law, the, the law of God with their traditions. Um, Christ calls them out for. Uh, on numerous occasions. Um, that's an interesting example. Right. They they decided to add the all those very detailed commands that they took to the nth degree 
that they, the doctrines and commandments of men, they added to the Word of God. They put these burdens, which Jesus said in Matthew 23, you know, they're not willing with their finger to lift one of them. And so when they read from Moses' law, listen to that. But don't listen to their commands, their doctrines. Uh, Hank, was there something else? I was just going to say, all throughout, you know, the Old Testament, they continued not to obey. Okay. All right. So you got King Saul, right? He he decides to offer up sacrifice because he's nervous. Samuel doesn't show up in 1 Samuel 13, so he takes it on himself. So he added two. It was the Levites. It was the priests who were supposed to do that. He decided to do it himself. You got Jeroboam. What did Jeroboam do? Anybody remember? What's that? Yeah. He, yeah, now he said you're worshiping God, but it was through those idols that he set up. Then he appointed priests who were not of the tribe of Levi. He appointed another feast day. And so he created religion after his own heart, really, is, is what he ended up doing. Judaizing teachers did the same thing. They added to the Word of God. So in all these cases, Nancy. Well, I had one where Christ pointed it out to the the scribes and Pharisees, he said they're teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. So that absolutely is adding or taking or both. Yes, yes, exactly right. So with all these cases where people added to or took from the Word of God, what's what's the end assessment of it? Where they how did they stand before God and how'd that work out for them? Well in Saul's case his lineage was cut off from from, you know. Does, does King Saul go down as he's one of the heroes of faith? No. No, he, he goes down as the worst king of the United Kingdom. And even with Solomon and everything he did, at least he came back. And you've got the Proverbs, you've got Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. You know, at least Solomon realized and turned around. Saul never did do that. Any other thoughts on that? Alright, so question three then. Why is it that we are not to add to or take from God's Word? Because it takes and reverses the truth. Okay. <laughs> Direct man in the first place. And, uh, and James says it's the perfect call, liberty. Perfect, complete. Okay. It is absolutely complete. There is nothing missing from the Word of God. And yet men all down through the ages have second-guessed God and God's wisdom and thought, well, we, we know better. The circumstances demand this. Uh, there's always some type of excuse. Additions can only corrupt... They can only corrupt God's religion and additions turn your loyalty to someone else because somebody else came up with that command. And so your loyalty shifts from God to a person, maybe yourself, maybe to someone else, but it, it shifts away. Um, Chris? So once you change the perfect word, it's no longer God's. The Son is created by man and His word is based on Exactly, Mike. I think that also we see in our own lives how quickly things change. And based upon this, based upon new evidence of this, this is something that does not change. But when we start adding to take away from it, it does start to change. We start to interject our own ideas, our own thinking, our own experiences. And so whenever we do that, this now is no longer the rock in which we can place our feet upon and will not move with our life. Exactly, exactly right. Remember, Peter said all things that pertain to life and godliness. It comes back to the word inspired. The word of God is inspired, and as soon as something is not inspired, it changes that. It nullifies the attribution. Exactly, exactly right. So, the reason we're not to add to or take from it, it is that divinely inspired word that is complete, and we'll. 
dig a little bit more on that in just a little bit as well. But he, he follows that up. You know, he says, you observe these things that you may live in verse 1. Don't add to, don't take from in verse 2. In verse 3, what does he remind them of? What you've seen. Okay. What your eyes have seen. And a very specific incident. Does anybody remember that incident that he cites here? You may have a footnote that tells you where it is in the Bible. He talks about what happened at Baal, Baal Peor. That's where Balak lured the children of Israel to commit idolatry. And what they did is they had sexual relations with the idolatrous women. They got them involved in that because remember, Balak and Barak were working together and they, they wanted the children of Israel to be cursed but God wouldn't let him curse it. But he counseled him and he said, well, you're not going to get God to turn against them unless they turned to idolatry and so let's get them involved in idolatry and when he did that then God cursed them and turned against them and punished them for that now that incident happened just weeks before Moses is preaching this it's very fresh on their mind and what he's doing is saying look what happens when you stray from the commandments you know that and so he's warning them don't follow that path. Be faithful and you will be alive. And he, he talks about the fact that those who held fast to the Lord are alive today, every one of you. So you've lived through it. Take that to heart and stay faithful. Any other thoughts down through 4 or 5? Alright, question number 4. How were others to view the Israelites and where is something similar taught in the New Testament? So, we're citing verse 6 here. Be careful to observe them for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is what kind of nation? Wise and understanding. Wise and understanding. Now, why would that be? Because they're practicing God's wisdom, not their own. Okay, practicing God's wisdom, not their own. Um, the law of Moses being unique among all laws of nations. Uh, just real quick before we come back to that a little bit more. Where is something similar in the New Testament? Uh, I've got uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. Okay. All Scripture is given by inspired inspiration of God and is proper for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction, for instruction, and righteousness. Okay. So we have the divine law given to us. And what does the New Testament admonish us to do? How, how does it picture Christians relative to the world? Here in Deuteronomy, he's saying, look, you as a nation, this is how you'll be viewed by other nations. And in that sense, we are now the nation of God how do these other nations out there view us? How should they view us? What, what does the New Testament say about that? Matthew 5.16 says, Let your light shine, that others will see your good works and glorify God. Okay. How does your light shine? And there may be multiple answers to that, but I'm going to lead us right into one. Okay. Let me ask you this. Um, Anybody ever been down into a cave and where they like turn the lights out if you've been on a cave tour, they turn the lights out and then they strike a match. They strike a match, they can light up a room this big with a match. It gives you enough light that you can see. But what if you go out on a cloudless day and you light a match outside? What, what kind of light does that provide? Yeah, virtually nothing, right? I mean, you can see it there, but it's not enhancing anything. That's because it's a light 
among an overwhelming life. But what kind of world do we live in? Yeah, we live in a world of darkness. And so, as Nancy cited Matthew 5.16, we're to be a light in this world where we can be a light. As we're following God's Word, we will stand out. We will be different in the world around us. Well, in that, in that specific application, um, I had down Ephesians 4.29, um, where, where Paul said um, that we'll impart grace to the ear. Let no um, evil communication come out of your mouth, that you might impart grace to the ear. So that's the imparting of the light. That's part of it. Our actions do it, but our words do it. Right. We're admonished again and again to have our honorable conduct among the Gentiles, among the people of the world, right? Just to sort of define the line that we're giving. That in Proverbs 4, verse 18, mm -hmm. the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines even brighter than the perfect day. So it's like the sun which is the brightest possible light to use. Right. So that's the path of the just. Exactly. Exactly right. We Just as ancient Israel in following God's law would be set apart and different than the people around them and the people around them would see that and take note of it and the ones who were noble and honest would say that is a good system. They, they have things good and right. And there are people in the world today that will look at Christians and they'll say they are good and decent people. They may disagree with us. They may have different viewpoints about religious beliefs and practices. But I have rarely heard of anyone who was in the world that would look at a member of the church and just think they're a scoundrel. If somebody's faithful to the Lord, they make a good impression on people. Mike? Yeah, you know, I was thinking of an example. Um, I thought about uh, Acts chapter 4, um, where it says, uh, Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. Uh, you know, the wisdom that they were showing, that they were speaking, uh, they, they recognized this is beyond what they should understand, what they should know. Yes, exactly right. Exactly. Great example of that. And so we stand out as a people. It used to be, um, even in our society, and I've heard tales of this, that back in the day, let's say the 1800s, 1900s, if there was a court case and they didn't have a Bible for people to lay their hands on, they would see if there was a member of the Church of Christ. And they would have them come up because members of the church were known for knowing the Bible so thoroughly. It's like they're a walking Bible. And that's really how we should be. That, that should be our aim. That When people think of us, they think of somebody who's devoted to God, a disciple of Christ, and they know the Word. They live that Word. So... Israel is to be like that. And he said back in Deuteronomy 4, verse 7, what would be the result of that? He says there's, there's going to be this effect, if you will. They would ask, you know, what, what great nation is this that God has done what? Or that God is in what condition? So near to it. So near to them. You, you look at that relationship that they have with God. And that's, that's how people need to see us. And just kind of wrapping this up, you know, in verse 8 he talks about what great nation is there has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you today. You know, as we've talked about, it's divinely revealed. Other nations had human opinions that were imperfect ideas and they need to be revised, they need to be repealed, they need to be abolished, they need to be altered over time. In fact, in our, our Constitution, what's in there that is just a, an admission, an acknowledgement, 
this is not perfect. A way to change it. A way to change it. You, you have the ability to add amendments. Because they could foresee, you know, we're just men putting this together. As great as I hope everybody here sees our Constitution is, you know, they, they acknowledge, you know, we could be missing something. So we need to make a provision. There's no provision for amendments in the Word of God. That's essentially what Moses is preaching here. There's no provision. Because God's law is perfect. When you follow it, people are going to look at you and, and think, wow, what a great nation that is. And if we follow God's Word, we follow it as a group, people are going to take note of that. They're going to see, look at those people. Aren't they devoted, dedicated? It'll stir their interest. All right. Let's move on now, please. Uh, 9 through 14. Deuteronomy 4, 9 through 14. Who will grab that for us? Mike. But you who held fast to the Lord your God, said 4, 9. Uh, yeah, chapter 4, verses 9 down through 14. Only give each of yourself and keep your soul diligently so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life. But make them known to your sons and to your grandsons. Remember the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, when the Lord said to me, Assemble the people to me that I may let them hear my word so they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth and that they may teach their children. He came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire to the very heart of the heavens, darkness, clouds, and thick gloom. Then the Lord spoke to you from the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but you saw no form, only a voice. So He declared to you His covenant, which He commanded you to perform, that is, the Ten Commandments, and He wrote them on two tablets of stone. Then the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments, that you might perform them in the land where you are going to over possess it. Okay, so be diligent to keep this covenant. Um, take heed. Don't forget what you've seen. It reminds me of Hebrews 2 where he says, lest you drift away. You know, take heed to the Word of God because you can drift. You, you can move away from it if you're not paying attention to it, if you're not diligently seeking it, learning it, applying it in your lives. And then he tells them, remember what happened at Horeb, which is basically what? I know... We just read through there, but what was that account? What was going on there? He talks about these tablets and darkness and cloud and fire. 24,000. Uh, Horeb. We're talking about Horeb in verses 10 to 14 here. Yeah, it, but it was actually that. Yeah, they heard a voice. Okay, who who is Moses talking to right here in Deuteronomy four? Second generation. Right, they were there though. I mean, I don't know how far down in the age group. I don't know if a three-year-old would remember that. It, does anybody remember anything from they were like two or three? I mean, it's like a vivid memory in your mind. Or maybe just a, a, maybe a faint memory. I would say something like that. They remember what they saw, you know, even at a very young age. Okay, so it talks about a mountain with fire and blackness and smoke and all that. So it's very similar to volcanic eruption. Do you think you would remember a volcanic eruption? <laughs> When you're, you know, three years old even. I remember when I was a kid in Kentucky, I think it was about four years old, it was, I don't know if anybody remembers this, it was called the Night of Tornadoes. There, there were like dozens and dozens and dozens of tornadoes that swept through the Midwest. And we were in our basement, I distinctly remember looking out the glass sliding door and seeing the lightning flash and everything going on out there. Um, it, I don't know why that's burned in my head, but I would imagine that there were people standing before Moses right there that day that when he starts talking about that mountain, those memories start kicking in. And remember, you, you go all the way up to 20, it was the ones 20 and over that died in the wilderness, so everybody under that, you think they were there 
watching that and hearing the voice of God, that was impressed in their mind. He just calls that back. Don't forget that. What happened there? Go ahead. They wouldn't have had the TV, YouTube, internet, <laughs> phones. They would sit around and told stories. They would have heard. That would have triggered their memories from childhood. You know, and right. used to when we were young and listened to what we told by our parents. Well, and you just imagine some of these people that are standing there that day, they were 15, 16 years old. They saw the plagues. They walked across the sea, Red Sea on dry ground. They went out to that mountain. They saw everything happen on that mountain. Everything that unfolded in that desert, all of that was was in their living memory. Mm -hmm. They heard the voice of God. Yeah. It was like nothing else. Yeah. I mean, that, if anything's going to stick in your memory, I think that I agree. I agree. You can see clouds, you can see storms, you can feel earthquakes, you can see volcanoes, all those kinds of things, but the voice of God, very unique. All right, we, we just need to move on here, so um, let's read verses, let's go 15 through, and I hate to break this up, let's go 15 through 19 to start with. Um, Deuteronomy 4, 15 to 19, he'll grab that for us. Charles, you want to, go ahead. Take therefore heed to yourself, for you saw no form when the Lord spoke to you from to you and for it out of the midst of the fire, lest you act corruptly and make your yourself a carved image in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or creature, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, and the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air. The likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, or the likeness of any fish that is in the water beneath the earth. Take heed lest you lift your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, you feel driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord your God has given to all the people under the whole heaven as a heritage. Okay, so essentially, what's he telling them? Okay, not to make idols. He, he lays out this argument, look, you didn't see a form of God. You're standing there at the mountain. God didn't appear in some form. He didn't appear in the form of man or anything else. So don't give him a form. It's just not right. Don't do that, Mike. Yeah, I think he's also saying that God's a jealous God. He doesn't want you bowing down before any other God except you. Yes. And he's as he lays out all these different specifics here, when he talks about you know male or female, wing bird, any, anything in the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, anything in the sea, the sun, the moon, the stars, don't 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 attach those things to God and make God in that image. Um, it just strikes me as. Interesting that that is exactly what man has done. He's made it an, an idol in, in all kinds of religions of every single thing God listed there. Yes. It was like a to-do list to some people. Yes. And it's, sorry about that. It's, it, he's really talking about the transcendent nature of God. And God is like nothing we see or touch or hear, any, anything here. Right? Alright, so... In Genesis chapter 1, what's the order that God gives? What You've got God at the top, and then what? And you've got man, and then what does He tell man to do? What does He say? Dominion over the earth, or we might even say creation, right? He tells that you have dominion over the face of the earth. He essentially says, everything's here for you. That's yours. You're over it. Right? So here in Deuteronomy 4, what he's saying is, don't upend God's order. Because they, they make it of the 
the beast, the animals, something from the sea, the sun, the moon, the stars, they're putting creation over them and themselves under that creature or whatever it may be. And then God may be down here, but really what ends up happening is they cut God out of the picture. So that's, he's selling don't up in God's order of things. That's wrong. It's sinful. And men, as Nancy said, try to do that all the time now. Any other thoughts there? What we find out here is just not a new concept. You know, it's kind of new age stuff. It's not old age stuff. To, today, people in our society generally don't put an actual physical image there but there is idolatry all over the place because all idolatry is is taking a desire and making it your God. So all you can just see what the idols were gods of certain things. Well, they want to get drunk. They just make them a god of alcohol. Woo! Now we can worship the God and get drunk or sex or materialism or war and violence. We'll just make us a God that approves of that and we'll worship. That's our God. Or many in that way. So men just do that exact same thing today. They're just more sophisticated in it. I was thinking about it, of course, in John 4, 24, it says God is a spirit. You know, we must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And in the revelation letter that you've been teaching, Stephen, you have used of course, the, the words that are there to help describe things, but it's all imagery. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's just giving us attributes and characteristics. But as you're noting here, God is a spirit. And from the very beginning, you know, mm -hmm. he doesn't want people to look to him as some kind of physical form. Right. And even in the book of Revelation, it describes. Jesus Christ with some of these very distinct things uh, about in chapter 1 about how he appears. Talks about him as a lamb. Talks about him as a lion. But when it talks about God the Father, God Almighty, it never gives any descriptions to him. It only talks about this voice coming from the throne. So even there, you know, it's emphasizing as Ron is saying, God is spirit. And that's how we need to see Him or conceive of Him and understand Him. Alright, so um, let's jump down verses 20 to 24. Who will read that for us? Phil. The Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be His people and inheritance as you are this day. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes and swore that I would not cross over the Jordan and that I would not enter the good land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. But I must die in this land. I must not cross over the Jordan. But you shall cross over and possess that good land. Take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you. And make for yourselves a carved image from the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. The Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Alright. So, Israel needed to be careful about what there? Verse 20. And 22. Where were they before? But verse 20, he, he gives it... I love this language here. The hard furnace. Okay, the iron furnace. You were in an iron furnace. You were there suffering, being tormented day in and day out. You were in that iron furnace. And basically what he's saying is, don't go from an iron furnace into a consuming fire. If you're not keeping this, the iron furnace is going to seem like nothing. These, again, they remember Egypt. They remember what it was like. They remember their parents being abused by the Egyptians. And he's saying, don't, don't be foolish and end up facing something 
worse than that. Um, the iron furnace, by the way, what, what's the purpose of an iron furnace? What do they do? Burn metals. Burn metals, why? Purify them. They get them heated up, right? You, you think about the, the steel mill or something, and they heat it up, they purify it, they refine it out. That's really what Egypt was supposed to be for the children of Israel, that they were... They, they went under that suffering to give them that drive and desire to leave, to turn their hearts to God. And so, it was a temporary suffering that God delivered them from, but God is a consuming fire. There's no end, no escape from that. Um, and so they have to be careful about that. So, we get to this point, Mike mentioned it a while ago, you know, God is a jealous God. And I asked you in question five to explain God's nature of both jealousy and mercy. How can He be jealous in a consuming fire and at the same time merciful? Because people have a problem with this. People want to see God as either He's all mercy or He's all fire. Same principle with seeing God as a just God, and people want to turn that into their justice. Debating. In other words, everything's going to turn out good for them. And that's what they talk to us. Whereas, whereas yeah. God, it's just like love, true love, does not give you everything that you want. Right. It gives you everything you need. Right. <laughs> right, exactly. Any other thoughts there, Ron? Well, speaking over in Romans chapter 11 where he talks about the natural branches that were removed and the others were grafted in. In verse 22 he says, Therefore consider the goodness and the severity of God on those who felt severity but toward you goodness if you continue in His goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. So He's giving us that comparative of those that were added to the grafted in. Right, right. Gentiles being grafted in. Yeah. If He grafted you in, He can cut you out. If He cut out the natural branch of the Jews, He can cut out the Gentiles. That's no problem. You know, to me, whenever I read that about his mercy, you know, it talks about Psalm 103, it says, For he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. Mm -hmm. he, he understands that and he knows that. And all the gifts that he gives us, whenever we go and we turn against him, we go what we're telling him is, Your gifts are not good enough for me. And everything you supply me is not good enough for me. That's why it's important that we understand why God is jealous. Hey, it, is jealousy a sin? Not in all cases. <laughs> okay. So, generally speaking, yeah, jealousy is a sin, but it says God's a jealous God. Somebody give me the context. Explain that, Mike. Well, also, love of things can be a sin. Okay. Love of other things can be a good thing. And so, you know, is it, you know, we have to be able to balance that out. Phil, so, as the creator, I mean, he can be jealous because he's jealous of his creation and wanting his creation to you know, acknowledge him, to worship him. So, I mean, it can't be a sin because God can't sin. It, it, was there another hand? The idea of the, the jealousy and the mercy to me, they, they both come back to a, a root cause of other people love. Especially when we, we start looking at, in this specific um, scenario, they're, they're talking about um, the idolatry, and we know that the church is compared to the bride. Um, and if, if you go back to, to any bride or groom, the aspect of jealousy and mercy are both very strong aspects of love. If the bride runs off with another guy, in this case the idol, there's going to be a strong, a very strong jealousy there. Um, but at the same point in time, that same love is what breeds the mercy to forgive that. Um, yes. Exactly right. So, 
2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, Paul said, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. There is a godly jealousy. My wife has a right to be jealous if I go and pursue another woman. She has that right. And God has the right to be jealous if we go and pursue another God. But then He has that mercy that if we will return to Him, He will forgive us. The book of Hosea is all about that kind of idea about you know somebody betraying you and coming back and you forgive them, you receive them. And the Lord's talking about Israel in that way. He will receive them back. So God is both a jealous God and He is a merciful God. Um, it depends on us and our actions, our attitude toward Him. Paul, very briefly. Okay. You can love your own family more than you do God. God said you have to be perfect. Yes. Yes, exactly right. Now, one thing, we're going to have to wrap it up here at verse 24, but Moses reminds them of something in verses 21 and 22. What does he remind them of? He's done with God. Okay. What did Moses do and what was the outcome of that? Well, it was where he, he struck the rock. He was to speak to the rock and provide water for the children of Israel. And because he struck the, the rock and actually used the word must we, mm -hmm. giving himself partnership with God of providing this, God said he could not enter into the promise. So he's sharing with them, even though he's done all this serving God, God is just, and that was his judgment. He's not bitter about it. No, Moses is not bringing this up here as a way of, of jabbing at them or jabbing at God. What he's doing here is saying, this is what happened to me. If it happened to me and I spoke face to face with God, don't think he's just going to overlook what you do. You look at my example and where I have been punished for this and I cannot go in. So he's reminding them of how serious and stern God can be. Even with his most faithful servants, he is an exacting God. But he's also, of course, a merciful God. So. We'll wrap it up there, uh, Lord willing. Let's pick up at um, verse 25. Please, please go ahead and do 5 and 6. Be ready for that. We'll try to roll as quickly as we can. And um, Mike will be praying for me all week to get to it next, <laughs> next week. But, all right, thank you all.